this is handy for your exams. And the good news is that Aldosterone only does two things, it's day job and it's side hustle. Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and today's video where we will be unpacking a little situation called hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism, which happens mainly in people with diabetic nephropathy. And this is one you need to know about for your exams. So grab a cuppa and get cozy and let's do this. Okay, so why do you need to know about hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism? I'm going to tell you that there are three reasons. Number one, it is associated with high potassium, chronic high potassium, which can be dangerous. So really good to know about potentially dangerous things. And number two, it most commonly happens in people with diabetic nephropathy. And there are a lot of people on planet Earth with diabetes. So if you are a practicing doctor, on planet Earth, chances are this in some way applies to you. And number three, this is handy for your exams because in order to understand this condition, you need to know a little bit about physiology. And when a medical condition meets physiology, it is just ripe for an MCQ. So for all of those reasons, I would highly recommend sticking around to the end of this video so we can bring you up to speed for exams and doctor life. Okay, hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism. I'm going to try to limit the amount of times that I have to say those two very long words together during this tutorial. So I'm just going to abbreviate this to HH. But as you can see from the name hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism, this condition features everyone's favourite hormone axis, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And so let's start by refreshing our memories on this little pathway. So it all begins in the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is a place in the nephron where there are a group of cells right next to the afferent arteriole that monitor our blood volume. And in response to a perceived low blood volume, these cells secrete renin. And renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which is converted to angiotensin 2 by ACE. And angiotensin 2 does so many things, including vasoconstriction to promote our blood pressure. But one of the things that angiotensin will do is go to the adrenal gland and promote the production of aldosterone. And aldosterone is something we really need to zoom in on and understand in order to understand HH. And the good news is that aldosterone only does two things. Just two things. That's all you need to remember. Two things. So you got this. So aldosterone goes to the kidney, to the collecting duct within the nephron, and there it does two jobs. It's day job, and it's side hustle. Aldosterone's day job is helping to reabsorb salt and water in the collecting duct in order to maintain our blood volume. And its side hustle is getting rid of hydrogen ions. Now let's unpack these in a little bit more detail. Let's start with salt and water reabsorption. When aldosterone comes to the collecting duct, it will bind to the mineralocorticoid receptor inside the cell. And this will change DNA transcription in order to increase the amount of channels and transporters on the cell membrane. Specifically, it will increase the amount of epithelial sodium channels, or ENAC, the sodium-potassium ATPase, and the ROMK channel, which is a potassium channel. And all of these channels work together, and it is just pure magic. Let me show you. So the sodium potassium ATPase was created by Mother Nature to move sodium around deliberately. And here, the purpose of this transporter is to create a concentration gradient within the cell. So sodium is pumped out of the cell, which means that sodium inside the cell is low. And so this creates a concentration gradient which encourages sodium to move into the cell using this little ENAC channel. So there's more sodium coming back into the body and that's going to help to create a concentration gradient to encourage water to come back into the body as well. But as you can see here, as we bring this sodium back into the body using the sodium-potassium ATPase, we swap it for potassium. 
but that potassium has to have somewhere to go and it's going to go into the urine via this potassium channel, ROMK. So that's aldosterone's day job, bringing sodium in and at the same time losing potassium from the body. But I told you that aldosterone also has a side hustle and that's getting rid of hydrogen ions in the collecting duct. And it does this by promoting the placement of hydrogen pumps on the intercalated cells so that we lose more hydrogen ions or acid in our urine. And when aldosterone goes to the kidney, it will do both of these things. So irrespective of whether it was sent there due to dehydration or acidosis, when it gets to the kidney, it does not discriminate. It just goes ahead and does both of its jobs for good measure. It's just aldosterone being aldosterone, which means salt and water is reabsorbed and potassium and hydrogen ions are lost in the urine. So now that we are crystal clear on the functions of aldosterone, we can more easily see the impact of having a low aldosterone or aldosterone resistance here in the collecting duct. If you had a low or ineffective aldosterone at this site, both of these functions of aldosterone would be impaired. We'd have less of an ability to absorb salt and water, and we'd have less of an ability to get rid of those hydrogen ions. And as a result, we can have high potassium and metabolic acidosis. And this metabolic acidosis is the same thing as type 4 renal tubular acidosis because this is the exact mechanism of that type of RTA. It's telling us there's a problem with aldosterone being low or blocked here in the collecting duct. So easy! And this makes understanding hyporenanemic hypoaldosterism very straightforward. And if you're having a panic attack at the thought of type 4 RTA, <laughs> don't worry, I have another video for that and I will link that at the end. So, hyporenanemic hypoaldosteronism. HH is most often seen in patients with diabetic nephropathy, but it can also happen in other conditions such as chronic interstitial nephritis. So what's basically happening here is there's a wonky juxtaglomerular apparatus that's not producing enough renin. And this can happen for a few reasons. It can be due to damage of these cells due to the diabetic changes within the kidney, or it could be due to impaired stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system due to autonomic neuropathy in diabetes. And it might also be that the person is actually fluid overloaded and renin is being inhibited because of that. So we have this situation where we have low renin production and this will lead to less aldosterone production. And this predisposes to chronic high potassium or type 4 renal tubular acidosis. And of course, muddying the waters is the fact that these patients with diabetic nephropathy are usually managed with RAS inhibitors, so ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers or potassium sparing diuretics in the context of their kidney disease. And this can further aggravate the problem. And on top of that, insulin resistance or deficiency can also lead to high potassium because remember insulin shoves potassium into cells so with less insulin around or insulin resistance again these people are predisposed to having a high potassium so how do you manage this honestly this has become a little bit more interesting in recent times so previously we would manage this as you would manage anyone with chronically high potassium. You would score off those RAS inhibitors and potassium sparing diuretics, you'd educate them about low potassium diet, correct their blood sugars and of course consider giving them medication which helps to get rid of potassium from the body. So using potassium binding resins such as rhizonium or a more modern version called pateromir. But of course, if you take away their RAS inhibitor, you're removing a treatment that has otherwise been shown to reduce proteinuria and delay decline in renal function in people with diabetic nephropathy. And of course, RAS inhibitors may also be having a cardioprotective effect. 
And so sometimes nowadays, if the potassium is only minimally elevated, the RAS inhibitor will be kept in play and pteromere will be added to the regimen to control their potassium and enable the RAS inhibitor to continue. And of course, there are now other treatments for diabetic nephropathy, such as SGLT2 inhibitors, which reduce proteinuria, but don't increase your potassium. So they are very helpful in this scenario as well. But of course, ultimately, the most important thing is to make sure that your patient has a safe level of potassium especially if their potassium is six millimoles per litre or above, I personally would work to get that into a very safe range before I dabbled with finessing all of the diabetic nephropathy medications. So get that potassium into a normal range. That might mean stopping the RAS inhibition for a period or some of the potassium sparing diuretics. Just make sure your patient is safe first and foremost. And then once the potassium is safe, that's the time to start fine tuning the medications for the diabetic nephropathy. See what you can sneak in, see how you can balance out that potassium. So that was the lowdown on aldosterone and hyporenanemic hypoaldosteronism. And if you have enjoyed this video, I have a couple more videos for you with aldosterone and RTA flavors. First of all, you're going to want to check out this tutorial on hyperaldosteronism and the renin-aldosterone ratio. That will demystify aldosterone situations for the win. And when you're done there, I also have a little 10 minute video for you on renal tubular acidosis to help you pick RTA out of a lineup in your MCQs and doctor life. So be sure to put those on your watch list for future study sessions. I'll leave the links below. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this helped your studies and I hope to see you again soon for some more high yield learning. Bye.